Okay, welcome back uh, to uh, Gateway NMRX, uh, NMRAX. Uh, our next uh, clinician up this afternoon is uh, Edward Kohler, and he's going to talk to us about uh, the town at the end of the line, the Coal Patch Communities. Uh, Edward is a 50-year member of both the NMRA and NRHS. He currently serves on the board of the Sunrise Trail Division NMRA. His last model railroad was dismantled when he was 16. He just celebrated his 68th birthday while in lockdown. He remains an avid railway enthusiast. Uh, and as an outgrowth with his interest in railways, he discovered the communities built and owned by the coal mining companies and other industries on visits to the East Broad Trap in Cambria, Indiana. Uh, and it notes that you're also the honorary battalion chief of the fire department city of New York, which is a, a major thing. Well done, sir. So if you want to start your clinic and take it away, we'll in, in, enjoy your presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, since you've all been staring at uh, my opening slide, we're just going to get right into it. Once coal was wealth. Horace Trumbauer designed the elms for the owner of the Berwyn Coal Company. Uh, this is a summer cottage. Let me repeat that. This is a summer cottage located in Newport, Rhode Island, where the rich and the famous went during the summer to avoid the city heat. Now, what I'd like you to do is remember that name, Horace Trumbauer. We'll get to him later. And for those of you who model the Pennsylvania coal country, Berwind Coal Company and their fleet of hopper cars should not be unfamiliar to you. The wealth from coal was hard won by workers who usually did not share in the riches. You load 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to a, the company store. This is from a country and Western song written by Merrill Travis in 1947. Some of you might be more familiar with it, uh, the Tennessee Ernie Ford recording in the uh, mid 1950s. Not only were the miners beholden to their employer, their families were also. In this presentation, we'll visit three distinct mining relating communities during the 21st century. In Europe, it was once common for industries, especially mines, to provide housing for their workers. In the United States, industrial housing was usually related to mining enterprises, but there were exceptions. In Pennsylvania, these were called coal patches. In this presentation, we will visit several coal patch communities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We'll be there long after the last of the coal has been wrested from the ground and the railroad tracks have been removed. The designations applied to certain houses in this presentation are those found in walking guides to the community or in the documents used to designate them historic areas. Our first stop will be the preserved village at Eckley in Luzerne County, which is now a property of the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission and has a connection to James Bond 007. A map of the Eckley area near Hazleton and uh, here we go, uh, the air. Here's Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and here is Eckley. It's really out in the middle of nowhere. During 1854, work began at the Council Ridge Colliery and the nearby village of Eckley. Both were owned by Sharp Weiss and Company, which leased the property. Ownership of the enterprise changed during 1875 and again in 1900 the property wouldn't, would be liquidated during 1963. Eckley Village was leased out to a film production company. The Molly Maguires was filmed there. It was then purchased by a group of businessmen who donated the town to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for use as a museum during 1971. The Visitor's Center at Eckley. Eckley is laid out along a single road, a back road once existed to the left. Eckley's backstreet housing was for the newest workers. Two families each had two rooms, and these room were single sheathed walls with no insulation. Think about, think about living in a plywood shed. 
1854 built duplex housed two families. Each had four rooms, two on each level. After 10 years of service, a miner in Eckley could rent this better house. Now, why was it a better house? Let's explain. It was still a duplex with each family having two rooms over two rooms, but the rooms were larger and the attic was partially usable, i.e. you could rent it out to another miner who, who was single and who could live there, giving you another source of income. These buildings were built starting in uh, circa 1865. A foreman's house, this one's been extended in the rear, dates from 1854. The foreman were, had their own private house. They did, were not duplexes. Every house in Eckley had a fully fenced in vegetable garden plot. This was the main source of vegetables for the family table. And the reason they were fenced, it kept the deer and the rabbits from plundering your local garden. Also in the backyard, plumbing in 1854 to 1865 consisted of outhouses. Indoor plumbing did not come to Eckley until 1963. In fact, the houses in Eckley didn't get electricity until the 1940s. There was no school in Eckley until 1912. The original company store and rooming house hotel buildings are long gone. With the colliery about a mile away, there were no railroad tracks in the vicinity of the village, but there were some social issues and then came the movie people. Unusually, there was a social club in Eckley where beer was sold. This is rather unusual because the coal patch communities in Pennsylvania were usually dry. Alcohol interfered with the good work practices that were wanted from the miners. The last thing a mine owner or mine foreman wanted was a miner with a hangover setting charges of dynamite down in the mine the next morning. The Roman Catholic Church of the Immaculate Conception was erected during 1861. There's also an Episcopalian church in uh, the Eckley village. The Catholic Church rectory is now the gift shop for the museum. The village doctor was housed in a foreman style dwelling. Uh, the doctor lived on the second floor. The bottom of the uh, floor was the doctor's waiting room and his uh, surgery, if you will. Kind of like to use the British term for it. A few owners' house ex houses exist at one end of the main road in Eckley. Uh, I don't have a picture of it, but one of the other houses has a bell tower on it, and that also served as an office. The bell was told to show uh, to give off the hour. Remember the miners were poor, clocks were not uh, owned by many people. So the village bell was how people would tell the time. The movie company added this structure to serve as a mule barn. Uh, basically it's just a facade. Here's a more accurate uh, interpretation of a mule barn at Eckley. Uh, there were once three of these buildings, mules being used extensively in the uh, mine. In the movie, this building served as both the company store and the railroad station. The section nearest to you was the company store, and the railroad station is that part of the structure to the rear with the uh, fenced off uh, platform. Eckley did not have a railroad station during its active coal patch life, or even now as museum life. The related Council Ridge Colliery about a mile away was served by the Lehigh Valley Railroad, but only for freight service. A quarter size breaker building was erected for the movie. Looks pretty big, doesn't it? But again, it's all perspective. The rail cars created for the movie were based on English designs. This is basically your English two plank uh, goods wagon, four wheel, I might add. And like I said, Eckley has a connection to uh, James Bond 007. And here's Sean Connery, who played a uh, member of uh, the Pinkerton, who was investigating Richard Harris and the uh, 
Molly Maguire's. And of course, uh, Mr. Harris and Mr. Connery both were had designs on Samantha Egger uh, during the movie. From Eckley, let's head to Robertsdale, Pennsylvania in Huntington County. Robertsdale is located at the effective end of the East Broadtop Railroad main line in the East Broadtop coal field. A map of the East Broadtop Railroad, it connects in Mount Union with uh, what was then the Pennsylvania Railroad, it's now Norfolk Southern, and goes through the Ogwick Valley to Orbisonia. At Orbisonia was the location of the shops. Today, the shops are still there. The Rock Hill Trolley Museum has a mile of track between Black Lock Narrows and Orb Orbisonia Rock Hill Furnace. Uh, the East Broad and then on through the mountains to Robertsdale. Uh, there's currently a plan in place to restore the East Broad Top, and that'll be from here from Ogwick to just shy of the grade crossing in Robertsdale. I can't figure out why they're doing those limits, but uh, that's another show. Robertsdale was the creation of the Rock Hill Coal and Iron Company, which had many of the same shareholders as the East Broadtop Railroad. Robertsdale as a community began in 1874. By 1875, there were 27 duplex uh, homes and a store. The town continued to grow in the early 20th century. Robertsdale was virtually rebuilt in 1910-1915. The Rock Hill Coal and Iron Company began to sell off its properties in Robertsdale during 1948. Mining continued until 1956, after which the company's remaining assets were sold to the Kovalchek Salvage Company. The Huntington County Historical Society has published a walking tour of the Robertsdale Coal Patch. The center of Robertsdale was a location known as Railroad Square, shown here in an old image. Here's a, uh, the train is on the Robertsdale Y. This is the coal company's uh, company store, the East Broadtop Shops, the Robertsdale Coal and Iron uh, Company uh, general offices, and this is the post office. Uh, structure. We'll look at these clo uh, closer. Now the planned restoration of the East Broad Top will end the other side of this grade crossing. It isn't really vis that visible in this picture. Let's look at the miners housing first and then the social assets in Robertsdale. Type A housing dates from circa 1880. 42 of these duplex houses still exist. They had two rooms over two rooms on each side. Type B housing from 1910. Split porches, notice the gap in between here, the two porches, and three rooms over three rooms on each side. Type BB housing, which is basically the same as the BB, but they have a full front porch. This was the doctor's house in uh, Robertsdale. One side was the medical office, the other side was the residence for the doctor. Type C housing from 1910. Basically, it's uh, a slightly different var variation on the BB. It's uh, two rooms over two rooms, and again, a duplex. Type D housing dates from 1910. It's a four room bungalow. There are approximately eight of them. I suspect these were used by uh, foremen or company clerks, people who were in uh, some sort of first level supervisory role. Type E duplex housing from 1910. This sample has been heavily modified on this site. It was called the four square because it was basically just a square. And today this is occupied by one family. They've changed the door. So there's only one front door instead of two and added this section here on the back. Probably a poor choice to illustrate the, the type B, but there are just so few of them left. Type EE housing. This had a door, two rooms here two rooms here, and the same on the other side of this dormer. There was a wall between the two units right in this area here. 
This is the mine superintendent's house in uh, Robertsdale. It dates from 1870. Notice he didn't have to share a wall. He had a duplex. He had a single family house. Let's look at some of what I call the social assets of Robertsdale. The Methodist church dates from the 1890s. It's now a museum. Well worth a visit if you're ever in the area on the weekends when it's open. The minister lived in this house three tenths of a mile away from the church. And surprisingly, it's not a duplex. The Catholic Church in Robertsdale, built in 1922, was dismantled during 1970. Salvage was used to build a church hall in Dudley. That building is now gone. The Presbyterian, Lutheran, and the Church of God congregations shared a building that no longer survives. The company store, Wright, was one of the first buildings in Robertsdale. It no longer stands. The storekeeper lived adjacent to the store. This relocated building was moved here circa 1904. It had been a Grange Hall in uh, nearby Dudley. Rock, this is the one that blows my mind. The Rock Hill Coal and Iron Company operated a 32 room hotel in the town. This is the 32 room hotel. Uh, I don't think the rooms were that large. Now the post office, this 1915 structure was the offices of the Rock Hill Coal and Iron Company. From 1915 to 1965, this building housed the Robertsdale Post Office. And at the other end of the building was the Robertsdale Barber Shop. The grammar school was an early social asset in Robertsdale. The first building housing it was constructed during 1870. No less than three generations of schoolhouses stood opposite the future site of the Catholic Church by 1900. These buildings no longer stand. If you go to Robertsdale today, the site of the Catholic Church is where the firehouse is located. A high school was erected during 1934. In large, it is now the local grammar school. During 1918, the Rock Hill Coal and Iron Company built the Liberty Theater to bring movies and entertainment to the isolated communities of Robertsdale. The Liberty burned down in 1936 and the land remained empty until 1948. The Reality Theater was built in 1948 and showed movies until recently. The choice of the name Reality was sort of a joke. People kept telling the guy who wanted to build it that it would never, it would never be a real thing. So when he built it, he called it the reality. Today, it's uh, home of the Church of God in Robertsdale. From 1874 until 1956, Robertsdale and its nearby coal mines were served by the narrow gauge East Broadtop Railroad. The town was graced by a full locomotive terminal and station. A new station was constructed during 1915. And here's the 1915 concrete block East Broadtop Station in Robertsdale. Behind these bay windows was the clerk and control stand for the car weighing scale, which believe it or not is still located right here in the tracks that have pretty much been overgrown and paved over. Robertsdale was remote enough that the East Broad Top provided housing for some of its employees in the community. A duplex house was erected circa 1913 on Lincoln Avenue next to the Methodist minister's home. East Broadtop Railroad's engineer's house in Robertsdale. It was a duplex. And although I don't have any facts to prove this, I suspect the engineer lived on one side and the conductor who had the job out of Robertsdale lived on the other. Why in Pennsylvania were many of the coal patch community houses built as duplexes? You know, if I'm doing this in person, I'd ask people to raise their hands, but uh, unfortunately we're distant learning via Australia. So I'm gonna give you the answer. It saved the coal miner, mine owners the cost of building one wall. That's correct. It saved the coal mine owners the cost of building one wall. From Southern Huntington County, we'll continue west to Cambria County, where we will visit the coal patches and railroad of Coleman and Weaver. Again, it is after the mining has stopped and the trains are no longer running. 
The coal lands of Coleman and Weaver lay west of the Pennsylvania Railroad's horseshoe curve. Here's Altoona horseshoe curve. Here's Revlock, Culver, and Nanty Glow, which are the three main uh, locations of uh, Coleman and Weaver's mine. Mines. B. Dawson Coleman and John Heisley Weaver formed a partnership during 1909. On June 30th, 1910, the Black Lick and Yellow Creek Railroad was purchased. It was renamed the Cambria and Indiana Railroad as of April 20th, 1911. As of October 1st, 1911, the Cambria and Indiana extended to, from Rexus to Elkdale Junction, where it divided with one line to Culver and the other to Manber. Now, Col where do we get Culver from? C-O-L from Coleman, V-E-R from Weaver. Manver, that's actually the name of the first two syllables. Each of these gentlemen had a daughter. So they be that became Manver. And the naming gets worse. A C and I, a Kinder in Indiana branch from Reagan Junction on the Culver line the Nanty Glow opened on March 12, 1916. They are, they are connected with the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was extended to Revlock during 1917. Revlock, C O L V E R, that's Culver, spelt backwards. The Cambrian, Indiana was eventually acquired by Bethlehem Steel. Much of the CNI was damaged by rain in 1977. The railroad was shut down during November 1994. The Cambrian Indiana complex at a time when they were rebuilding hopper cars for the Redding Company. Over here we have uh, engine house number one. This is the uh, main car shop. This is the Cambrian Indiana general general offices. In this spot here, it's already it was torn out in the 1940s. Was the Cambrian Indiana's uh, Culver Station. And if you look carefully right above the end of the car shops, you'll see the mine tipple, the tipple buildings. This is where the coal was brought to the surface. Here's engine house number one in Colfer, in approximately 2004, excuse me, 2014. Engine house number two when the Cambrian Indiana was still running. Notice the switcher uh, type locomotives. The Cambrian Indiana on the diesel era only had switcher type locomotives. They were set up uh, and balanced for road switching, but they still were the switcher car body. Engine house number two, 20 years after the shutdown. The Cambrian Indiana's car shop in Culver 20 years after. Notice the large number of uh, wheels here. For a number of years, a company rebuilt uh, axles and wheels for diesel locomotives in using the car shop building. The Cambrian, Indiana's general office in Culver was trackside. The Cambrian, Indiana Railroad was owned by a coal company. As a result, it had many coal country attributes, including the provision of housing for its workers in Culver. This housing was sold off in the early 1950s. The Cambrian, Indiana superintendent lived in this large house in Culver. I had a good friend uh, who passed away from COVID-19, Ray Kenny, who for a number of years was the superintendent of the Long Island Railroad. Uh, I often wished I had shown him this picture and asked him what size house the Long Island Railroad gave him but I know the Rail Long Island Railroad didn't. Cambrian, Indiana workers had brick duplex housing in Culver. Cambrian, Indiana also had some wood and brick single houses in Culver. A plan to build a major yard and engine facility at Eleanor Yard near Nanty Glow in the 1930s resulted in the construction of several duplex brick houses on a new street, Weaver Circle. These plans never went forward, but the Cambrian, Indiana operated these rental properties for years. And here's one of the uh, Cambrian, Indiana houses on Weaver Circle near 
near Nancy Glow. The Cambrian, Indiana was experienced about 20 miles of light engine movements every day in the early 1990s. To reduce costs, it was planned to close Culver and build a new engine house in Revlock. A building was constructed near the Monroe Mine in Revlock, but it was never occupied. The unused Revlock uh, engine house, it still stands, a rather uh, modern building. Cambrian, Indiana, passing the uh, coal, uh, Monroe Coal Company boiler house back in the day. The same building 20 years after the last train. Coleman and Weaver established three coal companies to mine their various coal properties. The Evansburg Coal Company was established to mine the new at the new community of Culver. First residential construction at the Culver site was at a location now known as 20 Row. A total of 20 duplex houses were erected near the Cambrian Indiana Railroad shops along a single road during April 1911. Five additional single houses were added here by 1925. Here's a from the Library of Congress. Here's a picture of 20 Row in 1985. 20 Row in 2015. Here's a typical 20 row duplex house built in April, 1911. Notice these forest green diamond shaped asbestos uh, shingles. This was a hallmark of Coleman and Weaver's uh, coal mining community buildings, houses. The Evans Shade Mine Tipple in Culver was adjacent to 20 row. This was located right immediately Behind and to my right would be the uh, shops of the Cambrian Indiana Railroad. This picture is from the Library of Congress. Originally, only 20 row was called Culver. And why was it called 20 row? There were 20 houses on it. The main portion of the community was called Culver Heights. Today, it's all considered Culver. Culver Heights area was laid out in a grid pattern centered on Reese Avenue by the Cambrian Indiana Railroad Surveyor. The Coleman and Weaver firm engaged architect Horace Trumbauer. You remember him, he built that big house in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. But Howard Trumbauer of Philadelphia designed the principal buildings. He's also considered the designer of the miners housing. And keep that old, keep that, Newport Cottage in mind as we begin to look at the uh, housing here in uh, Colvin. South of Reese Avenue, there were 72 four-room houses, 18 six-room houses, and 17 single-level three-room houses. These houses were all built during 1912. North of Reese Avenue in the town were 72 six-room houses and 11 three-room houses. They were also built in 1912. North of Reese Avenue, 24 six-room houses were built during 1915. During 1921, 1923, an additional 36 four-room houses were added south of Reese Avenue. North of Reese Avenue, 30 four-room houses were added. So as the coal, demand for coal went up, the need for coal miner housing went up. This sign greets visitors to the community of Culver. And as one can tell by the undercarriage of this uh, Faux rail car, that's not a real miner's wagon. A 1985 view of housing in Culver from the uh, Library of Congress. Let's take a closer look. A six room house in Culver with the original uh, green asbestos shingles. A four room house in Culver with new siding. A three room house on the north side of Reese Avenue in Culver. This one is in absolutely terrible condition, but it's still got the original uh, asbestos siding on it. By the way, three rooms, uh, two rooms on the first floor and the upstairs was one big large room. The smallest worker, worker housing in Culver were these three room bungalows. Again, I suspect they were for mid-level or entry-level supervisors. This one has been, uh, has had the porch added on this side and over here on the left and the garage added after its coal mining uh, days. The residence of the chief clerk of the mine at, Col at Culver. 
This was an important guy. So he got a big, better house, but not the best. The mine foreman's house in Culver, again, it's similar to the chief clerk's, but it has this wing off here to the side. And on to the social assets in the community of Culver. Company office building in 1985. The former Evansburg Coal Company offices in Culver, 2015. Between the company store and the company office, an entertainment theater building once stood. The last movie was shown in 1940. The building was demolished in 2010 due to fears it would collapse on itself. Don't have a picture of it, sorry. Here's the former company store in Culver, though. Over here to the left would be the enter entertainment uh, building and plus the Cambrian, Indiana station for Culver Heights. Across Reese Avenue is the former store manager's house. Again, it's a larger, more substantial structure. The Ebenshade Coal Company built a hotel for commercial travelers in Culver. This is a 1985 view of the structure. And the hotel in 2017, it's now an apartment house. The old Culver community lockup. I'm sure a couple of miners spent a cold night or two in there one time or another. The Evanshade Coal Company was at Coleman and Weaver were really uh, interested in their workers. One of the things they did was they built a hospital for their workers in Culver, which was also available to their workers from Revlock. The Evansburg Coal Company also operated both a dairy farm and a hen house at Culver, providing fresh, fresh milk and eggs to the mining families. Both were removed in the early 1940s. Still surviving, however, is a community park located on the south side of the community. There were no less than three churches in Culver, a Catholic, Presbyterian, Greek Orthodox. All three have been extensively rebuilt since the coal company days. The original Culver School was also replaced in the 1950s. It's now closed with students attending another institution outside of the community. Bethlehem Steel, as the eventual successor to Coleman and Weaver, began selling the Culver properties to the tenants in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Mining ceased in Culver during 1978. While the tipple was downhill near 20 row, there was a man shaft that came up along Reese Avenue in Culver. The arrow points to the site of the man shaft. The rest of this parking lot was, at that time, was occupied by a, by a wash house where the miners could take a shower after uh, working in the mine. Just to the northwest of Culver was another residential area called Shantytown which was home to a large number of three-room, poorly constructed bungalows. This was the first community that recent immigrants from Eastern Europe were settled into. Shantytown was totally demolished prior to 1985. An electric burn plant burning comb is on its site, comb or coal waste. I have not been able to find a picture of Shantytown, or at least the Shantytown located here. Coleman and Weaver established the Monroe Coal Company to exploit their holdings at a location that was named Revlock. This community was 5.8 highway miles from Culver, but the distance on the Cambrian Indiana Railroad was 15.8 miles. En route from Culver to Revlock by highway, you pass through the hamlet of Tripoli. Here, the United Mine Workers Local 860 would build their hall during 1934 located off of the properties of Coleman and Weaver who were anti-union. And here's the local 860 uh, Union Hall in Tripoli, Pennsylvania. It's now been cut up into an apartment house. The Moron Monroe Coal Company began to develop Revlock during 1916. The community occupies 83 acres with a grid street pattern. Like Culver, Revlock sits on a slope above the actual mine location. A total of 144 houses were erected in Revlock in the 1916 to 1918 period. Revlock is one of the first coal patch communities to have indoor plumbing and electricity in the miners' housing at the time of, constru of their construction. Yes, 
indoor plumbing and electricity. Horace Trumbauer, where have we heard that name before? Of Philadelphia was hired to design the housing in Revlock. He de developed five basic designs, which we'll see shortly. He also designed a company store, company office, company store, and a grammar school. Three churches with parish houses would be built in Revlock by their respective congregations. Let's look at the community. The sign at the eastern entrance to Revlock facing US Route 22. After a snowstorm in 1994, Revlock certainly had a gritty look to it. Actually, the eastern entrance opens up to a community park. A two-story semi-detached four-room house, original shingles at this end. Semi-detached, this is another way of saying duplex. A wood frame, two-story, four-room detached house. The porch and garage were added uh, later. Uh, the other two-story wood frame design in Revlock with a front addition. Again, this is still a four-room house. A two-story wood frame, six-room house with an added porch and rear extension. A six-room house for a manager. Basically, they were the same build, building as the wood one, but this had a brick facade added to it. Also, the manager's houses were located on top of the hill overlooking the town of Revlock. The Coleman family had full control of the Monroe Coal Company after the death of B. Dawson Coleman on March 23rd, 1933. Prior to selling the mine to Bethlehem Steel during 1948, they sold off the residences in Revlock generally to their tenants. Let's go on to the social assets of Revlock. A Horace Trumbauer designed Revlock Public School is now an apartment house. The company store in Revlock closed in, on February 2nd, 1950, and that closure was caused by a law, change in law in Pennsylvania that prohibited coal, coal mining firms to operate their company stores, and the building was abandoned. The remains of the structure were demolished after 1994 and a modern private dwelling erected on its site. It's a nice ranch house, but you know, it's not your classic company store building. The store manager's house survives a six room brick facade dwelling two blocks away from the store. The garage uh, has been added. The former Monroe company office sits next to the road linking the mine to the residential area. The road is in the back uh, the coal company office has now been purchased by the Catholic Church in uh, in that in the town, and uh, they use it as an outreach center. Mining at Revlock ceased during 1982, but the Cambrian Indiana Railroad continued to remove coal from the mine storage pile until September 17, 1985. At the mine site, only three buildings still stand. One we've seen already, the Cambrian, Indiana uh, aborted engine house. This is the former miner's wash house, which dates from the 1940s. We saw this image of the mine's boiler house earlier. And here's a 2014 view of the same boiler house. Coleman and Weaver established the Hazley Coal Company in the borough of Nanty Globe during 1915. Paisley was the middle name of Coleman. Scattered height site housing was provided in 1915 in this already established community, which was actually made up of a number of coal patch settlements built by multiple firms. There were also a number of non-coal company related uh, residential areas. From the Library of Congress, miners housing in Nanty Glow circa 1940s, the mining company who owned these houses is unknown, but notice they are all do with the front two front doors. These buildings closest to us are all duplexes. And these larger buildings of a different design are probably also duplexes. These are probably two rooms over two rooms on each side. And these are probably three or four rooms over four rooms on or three rooms on each side. The main building from the Coleman and Weaver era that survives in Nanticlow is the Harold Trumbauer Design Company store on Lloyd Street. The store opened during 1918 and closed on February 2nd, 1950. Again, by uh, 
action of Pennsylvania state law. The old company store in Nantiglow is now Moose Lodge 207. So the next time you see a coal train or some switchers setting out to pick up some loads or even just a line of hopper cars in a yard, remember the lives of the coal miners and their families in these and other coal patch communities. These stories are not pretty and deserve a presentation of their own. We began in Eckley, so we shall end uh, there with a circa 1900 picture showing a East, what appears to be an Eastern European uh, family recently arrived in the community. You load 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Thank you, Merle Travis. Walter Walters hmm, will sell you a two pack kit of company houses for $40. Notice they are not duplexes. Uh, I've traveled in some sections of West Virginia and seen that company housing in West Virginia tended to be uh, single family houses. So that's probably what they're based on, but maybe I'm taking an influence by the Clinchfield uh, hopper car in the background and the CNO locomotive. Uh, certainly these houses are set up to look more prosperous and uh, lovely than uh, that they were in real, would be in real life. The uh, mining companies would never paint these houses white. There was just too much soot and dirt in the air uh, for a mining patch. For, for white paint to survive. I want to thank you for viewing this presentation. Are there any questions, comments, or constructive criticisms? I'd be more than happy uh, to listen to them. And here's your legal stuff. The text, basically, this was, I wrote this in 2017, but this is actually only the second time it's been shown. So thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any questions, uh, I think the, uh, They'll uh, be provided now by. by yeah, okay. If you want to stop uh, sharing right now, then we do have some questions uh, from the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, uh, somebody noted that uh, you talked about uh, the companies uh, building duplex houses. Uh, somebody know the textile industry in the south uh, built duplex company houses as well. So I guess uh, frugality was a, a trait amongst uh, companies. Uh, Neil Erickson from Hawaii notes is a lot of good reasons to build two plexes other than one interior wall, but he doesn't elaborate. Uh, fella asked, not sure if you missed it, but what was the motivation, your motivation to re uh, research uh, the towns and what were your major resources or sources? Okay, let me just stop and say that uh, I photographed a town uh, built by a paper mill company up in Maine, and they're all duplex houses. Also, uh, if anyone has does any sewing, Coates and Clark, the thread company, they had a big plant in Newark, New Jersey. And across the street from the plant, there were a number of tenements that Coates and Clark owned, and they used that as industrial housing. Now, how did I get involved in this craziness? Well, I've always been a very anal type thing, want, person wanting to know everything I could about the subject. I was visiting the East Broadtop and I picked up a folder on the walking tour of uh, Robertsdale. And it was like, oh my goodness, look at all this stuff. And then I also got involved with some uh, Cambrian, Indiana stuff and saw that it was a historical, uh, both communities there have been uh, created as historic districts. And with anything that's a historic district, there's always plenty of federal paperwork and you can always research that federal paperwork. Uh, I don't know, it just sort of grew out of uh, my research into abandoned rail and shut down railroads. You know, why did the railroads go? I mean, I don't want to denigrate anyone, 
uh, you know, many model railroads, you're basically some sort of circle or out and back. But, you know, real railroads had a purpose. They went from point A to point B and they did something. And in order for them to do something, something had to happen at their terminal. And it's, I guess that's just uh, wanting to know as much as I can and as far as I can. An interesting subject once you get into it. Uh, somebody's Absolutely. somebody's commenting about the East Broadtop. Uh, do you know why they're stopping the uh, line before the crossing and not making use of that? Why? Uh, actually, they, if they stop short of the crossing, uh, there's no way they can use the Y because the switch uh, they, they won't have enough room to get the train past the switch. They are also stopping at the north end in the middle of the Ogwick Creek Bridge. What I, I don't know for sure why they are stopping at those two particular locations. My suspicion is since that road in Robertsdale is a major state route and at the other end near Ogwick, it's also a major, just beyond there is another major state route I think they are avoiding the cost of providing highway crossing protection. Uh, also to renovate the Y in Robertsdale, the tail, and this is another show on the East Broad Top, uh, the, the tail of the Y is actually built on two bridges over, over Ogwick Creek. I suspect it's a wetland and there'll be all sorts of permitting processes to, uh, Get, be able to reinstate that Y, even though the track is a national historic site and the bridges were there well before uh, the wetland uh, protection uh, laws came into effect. Uh, I would ask them. They've got a website. Yeah. There you go. Uh, another question. Uh, after doing all the research on the patches, besides the Walters and City Classics Company house kits, what else would you use to model a patch? And what structures of a patch are important to include? Okay. I'll give you, I, in my introduction, it was mentioned, I dismantled my last model railroad layout when I'm 16 and I'm now 68. There's a good clue that I'm not current on modeling. But be that as it may, I will talk, I can talk more about the buildings. What you should have is sufficient housing for the uh, for the miners, and there should be several layers of housing. You generally will have a mine foreman or superintendent, so he'll have a good house. You will then have, at least in terms of Pennsylvania, the licensed miners. These are the people who had the license to be miners. They would have a reasonably decent house, although not as fancy as the mine superintendent. The next layer down is the homes of the laborers. Every miner would have two to three laborers working for them. They would have horror housing, if you will. The uh, Remember at the beginning of the show at Eckley, the plywood shack, something like that. Uh, I mean, I could get into a whole bunch of uh, discussions about uh, about uh, the families and the living arrangements in the uh, in the coal patches, but I think that gets beyond uh, modeling it. Basically, you would have some sort of housing. You would have at least one mine or office for the mine, and a company store to supply the miners with their supplies, plus a boarding house structure and a doctor's house. Now, the doctor could just be in one of the miners' houses with a shingle hanging out in front of it. The boarding house might be a little different because there are always people coming in and out of these mining communities, either salesmen going door to door, people coming to visit the coal mine to uh, determine whether or not they were going to buy coal for, for the firms they represented. It's, I, that basically would be it. Now, on coal mines that they use mules or animals to haul, you would have a barn and a uh, and a paddock 
for uh, for the mules. Okay. Does that answer your question? Or... I, I, th I think that answers the question. It's uh, a lot of different things, and you can certainly go a long way to uh, and, do what oh, you yeah, want. One, one other thing, and this is something I'm going to tell most modelers miss. These are communities that didn't have running water. So in these communities, you will have every every house, every other house will have a pump. And behind every house is the every ever popular outhouse. Can't forget the outhouse. All right. Thanks very much, Edward. A very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we've all learned a bit about the coal country and uh, the people who lived there at the times. And uh, thank you for doing that for us for uh, Gateway NMREX. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll be here again on uh, Wednesday. I'll be doing a discussion of uh, portraying firefighting and fire trucks on model railroads. That's uh, Wednesday at eight o'clock. I'm sorry if I got to plug in for myself, but if I don't, who will? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thanks very much, Edward. Thank you.